Thank you so much, Carol, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Caudillo. I'm a senior advisor at the White House, uh, White House Hispanic Prosperity Initiative in Washington, D.C. But knowing that your school is in Las Vegas, I am also a Las Vegas. I grew up in Las Vegas, and so it's good to see uh, Vegas representation. And so I'll, I'll allow my other judges to introduce themselves. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Jen Howell. I am the co-executive director of Virginia Civics. We are the home of the Virginia We the People program. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tom Tinder and I'm an attorney in Charleston, West Virginia. And may the panel um, introduce themselves and their teacher. Hi, I'm Aya Dimash and me and my colleagues are in eighth grade from Faith Lutheran Middle School and High School and we are representing Unit 3. Good afternoon, my name is Olivia Ardeen. And I'm Bella Mara. This is our teacher, Ms. Carroll. Thank you for hearing our speech at this congressional hearing. Wonderful. Well, just before we get started with your presentation, I'm gonna go read the question. And then after I finish reading the question, then you may begin. In the Virginia plan, James Madison proposed proportional representation in both houses of Congress. The delegates rejected Madison's proposal in favor of the Great Compromise. What is the Great Compromise and how was it justified? Do you think the founders' justification is acceptable today? Why or why not? What are the advantages and disadvantages of equal representation in the Senate? What are the advantages and disadvantages of changing the Senate to proportional representation? You may begin. David Lloyd George, a great English philosopher whom our country's principles were based on, once said, proportional representation is a device used to defeat democracy, the principle of which there's establishing groups and disintegrating parties. Because this country was created in the best interest of the citizens, the importance of allowing there to be unproportional representation of each party heightens the idea that there is equal representation of all kinds of people. This justifies many decisions made throughout history that if compromised would not have had an impact. All government, indeed, every human benefit and enjoyment, every virtue and every prudent act is founded on compromise and barter. Edmund Burke. During the Philadelphia Convention, the framers created the Great Compromise in which they addressed any contingencies. The justification for this proposition rested on the exigency to settle debate. Today, however, many people still debate these same issues. We have even seen their compromise fade throughout history, where the three-fifths compromise was overruled with the ratification of the 13th Amendment where it states that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. Among the heavily debated topics today includes the process by which the president is selected through the Electoral College. A poll conducted by Gallup in 2020 shows a majority or 61% of Americans in favor of switching the popular vote for presidential elections. However, it was created in the interest to making sure the smaller states had an equal voice to larger states, so it remains a very controversial issue. Some people also believe that with our country's growing population, it would be more beneficial to have proportional representation in the Senate. We need to put the idea of proportionality at the center of our concept of representation, stated Lanny Gurner. With a changing society comes different ideas and evolving concepts that might need to be met in order to stop debate. There are both advantages and disadvantages to equal representation in the Senate. It took many months to find a suitable plan for representation in Congress. The plans that didn't pass include the Virginia plan, which focused more on proportional representation, and the New Jersey plan, which focused more on equal representation. The debate between the two plans went on for months before the Great Compromise was decided, which split Congress up into two parts, the House of Representatives, which is based on proportional representation, and the Senate, which is based on equal representation. An advantage is that smaller states' votes are counted with equal input to the larger states, making sure their voices are heard. A disadvantage is that larger populations wouldn't be able to portray the views of the entire state and differing opinions that come with it. Proportional representation has many different aspects, good and bad, that should be reviewed. One argument that supports this is that it limits the effects of extremism in the Senate. It is more difficult to have extremism with this kind of representation because representatives are required to build consensus through compromise. On the other hand, it does not provide specific communities direct representation. This can lead to the undermining and underrepresentation of many communities, causing them to feel like their voices don't matter. The preamble to the Constitution says, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense. The key part of this quote is provide for the common defense, meaning the protection and care of all citizens. 
On the 23rd of January of this year, the Senate adopted one article of impeachment for Donald Trump on inciting an insurrection, causing him to be impeached for a second time. By having representation from both parties, there was representation for all types of people with different beliefs and morals to use their best judgment to choose what they believe is best for the country. The Great Compromise is something that dramatically shaped our history and created the system of government we know today. But there are still debates over whether equal or proportional representation will be more beneficial. The framers needed to compromise, and we will need to as well, because as Tryon Edwards says, compromise is about the sacrifice of one right or good in the hope of retaining the other. Thank you for listening to our speech. We are now ready for questions. Excellent. And so let's continue on that debate, especially on, on these issues. And so the, my first question is, pretend you're in the driver's seat and, 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 and whether you wanna be able to do this or not, in your opinion, should we change the constitution to make representation in the Senate based on population? Why or why not? I personally believe that it would be good to switch to proportional representation because as we stated in our speech with the continual growth of population in our country, there's many states that have a very large population and with only two senators, it can make them feel like their voices aren't properly heard. And according to James Madison, uh, power should be immediately derived from people in accordance to their population. I disagree with my colleague. I think we should keep representation how it is currently because this was one of the major compromises made in rep about representation. And if we were to change that, I think it would affect the smaller states and the larger states because it wouldn't provide the proper representation both of them wanted now. And I think that would cause many problems to arise. And to add on to both of theirs, I actually agree with my first colleague in saying that proportional representation will be more beneficial because a local study done in an election showed that when using the electoral college, it would have been more beneficial to use proportional representation and have a more equal and diverse voting for who would. Um, so going off of that, why do you think it was important for states to have representation? I mean, the Constitution starts with we the people. So why, why do states need to have any sort of representation? Um, I believe the states need representation because um, it's because the states represent the people's voice in their state and the state legislatures and um, government are supposed to listen to the people's decisions and go along with their voices. So in doing so and having representation for the state, it represents the people. To add on to that, I think it would be very difficult to represent each person individually and through the state, it represents the main ideas that each each person wants for their country and for their state specifically. And it's best to have um, most of the, the states as a representation instead of like individual people. So it would be less representation if it was individual people. And with the states, it kind of bring, brings more people in with the representation. And to add on to both of them, while we do need a full government to keep everyone in check, which we see in Shay's Rebellion, it also correctly identifies smaller views and how properly everyone can get at least some of their ideas out there with state governments. You mentioned uh, political parties and we have two uh, major political parties here in the United States, but there are other countries that have multiple political parties, four or five, six, seven. Um, do you think that we should have more political parties in the United States? Why or why not? Um, I believe that it could be beneficial to have more political parties as long as they're all, all properly represent, represented in government because um, it allows more people to express their ideas rather than having to fit into one or the other. They can fit into like a middle ground type of scenario and they can choose the ideas that really speak true to them. Um, I disagree with my colleague. I think having two different parties fits it best because both parties are actually very like wide and open. They have many different like beliefs and morals and it's 
some people can find a way to match it like wh whether it's like from simple beliefs that party has to like major beliefs and it's just better because that causes less argument and less division in the country next question is and near the end at the end of your presentation the, the great compromise there's still debate about it even today and so what areas of the great compromise um, do you think we need to be talking about more um, and so just that's my question to you i definitely think we need to be talking more about representation because one of the major debates today is whether there should be proportional or equal representation in the senate and another major issue would it be the Electoral College, which 61% um, of Americans say they wish to get rid of. So I think that's a major issue that needs to be addressed and talked about further. To add on to that, um, the Electoral College can be found in the Constitution in Article 2, Section 1. And many people believe that it should be abolished just because they think it doesn't actually take in all their votes because it sometimes the result of the election comes out the opposite of the popular vote, but many don't know that it actually provides representation for the smaller states. And without that, the larger states would overrule all the smaller states with their popular vote. And to add on to that, when we think of the Great Compromise, we tend to think of proportional or equal representation instead of the fact that they're blending together and either one or the other. And I think we need to focus on how they work together and seeing if there's a way we can improve that so that the country can work in a better standard. Okay, so uh, just, I guess the logical next question is if, if you could do it all over again and create a system that works best for the country as it is now, what, and you could, you know, say you could start all over, scrap, scrap everything and start over, what kind of system do you think would work best? Well, I believe for one, getting rid of the electoral college is, and using popular vote for presidential elections, because I mean, even as we saw in the 2016 election, uh, Hillary Clinton got more popular vote, but Donald Trump was still elected as president. And in accordance to what Thomas Gilpin said, it is the right of every interest to be represented as far as possible. And that is not possible with the electoral college. And to add on to that, um, when the comp, sorry, when the constitution was first founded and more recently in the elections, it, many people weren't politically educated, which is shown where there was a, only a 32.3% voter turnout in the 18,000 election. But currently, I think if we switch to more proportional representation and everyone is more educated in the ways of being able to understand what's really going on because of how open and much more information is being shared in current times, it would be more beneficial to have proportional. You know, one of our states, uh, Nebraska, has a uh, unicameral uh, legislative body, you know, just one body, instead of having uh, both a uh, House and a Senate and a bicameral uh, government. Uh, why do you think other states have not adopted the unicameral uh, government model? Uh, and why or, or why not? I believe that the states haven't adopted that way because some states are much larger and it's much harder to provide the proper representation and get many more things done to um, with just one body. Thank you. Feel free to take a deep breath and breathe out because you have completed. Thank you so much. You've completed the uh, presentation and the discussion with us. And so I want to commend you on an excellent presentation. Um, I, I really enjoyed the quotes, the different political philosophy uh, quotes that you just added there. That's so interesting because this is, a lot of this is a political science questions and to bring in quotes to start off and just sprinkle it throughout. I thought it was, was amazing. So I commend you and continue using that. There's um it's a good source to use because it makes us think more about like oh okay how's this how influence then thus the use of proportional representation or having to limit it through equal representation and so forth and i like also like the answer at, at one of the one of my responses about how about 
that blending them and working together instead of more of that opposing each other. And so that's a good good thought to think. Um, so I commend you on that. And, 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 and yeah, excellent presentation. I'll uh, ask my fellow judges to, uh, to also comment. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed our conversation. You guys work together very well as a team and I like that you were able to pick up off of each other so well. Um, I would say I love how uh, sort of philosophical your uh, your opening statement was. I mean, it, it gave your presentation a depth that we don't often see in these presentations. Um, that said, the you know the flip side of that is uh, maybe think about ways, um, you know, very practical, very like at home ways that these questions affect you and your life and the people around you, right? I would have loved to have heard you talk a little bit about, you know, where Nevada fits in with, with all of these questions. Um, but I mean, really, I, I just really enjoyed everything that you had to say as your examples were great. And um, yeah, just keep thinking these big thoughts. I'm excited for our conversation tomorrow. I'd just start out by saying hats off to the teacher. The teacher's done a great job. Um, one of you, uh, you stated in your opening comment that this was a congressional hearing. Uh, and, and that's not said very often. Uh, you, but you understand what this We the People program is all about. It's a congressional hearing, and we are a congressional panel, supposedly, and you are experts coming before us to talk about uh, particular issues. And you certainly uh, surpassed the role of being experts. You had a, a wealth of good information in that opening presentation that you provided to us, and, and it was right on the mark as it related to uh, the questions that were asked uh, for you to answer in your opening presentation. Uh, I agree with my colleague about, uh, about your use of, uh, of uh, quotes. I love the one that uh, it's compromise and barter, that that's what uh, our uh, country's all about. Um, it, the other thing is, is, that, is that you, um, uh, I think in every question uh, you would say, I'd like to add on to what my colleague said. And that's a technique that is used by a lot of groups, a lot of the groups that appear in front of us so that someone can just participate and say, I agree uh, with my colleague. Um, but you went a big step beyond that because you said, I agree be, and I wanna add on dot, 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 dot. And you gave us another fact, information, something that you had researched. It wasn't just saying, I agree, uh, it was, I agree because, and giving us some additional information. And then when you disagreed, you did something that we need a lot more of in our civil discourse today. And that is you disagreed without being disagreeable. Uh, you gave us important facts uh, and information on the other side of the issue. So it was just a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, and, and, and finally, I wanted to say to you, you know, sometimes uh, we'll have some students that, you know, why, why are we talking about this stuff from 250 years ago and da 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 da. But you gave outstanding examples of how uh, it comes right up to the present when you talked about the 2016 election, when you talked about the impeachment in January. I, I mean, this stuff that occurred 250 years ago or these decisions that were made have current application and current, uh, they relate to our current situation. So uh, congratulations to you, it was very well done. And please continue to uh, utilize your knowledge and your leadership skills uh, on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday for the rest of your life. We need to have good citizens like you uh, involved in our communities. Uh, and in our states and in our nation. Uh, thank you very much. Best of luck to you.